Welcome back, everyone, to Furthering Christendom. I am your co-host, Mike DeVito, here with Dr. Tyler McNabb. And today we have another special guest, Dr. Benjamin Arbor. Dr. Arbor is the Executive Director of the Institute of Philosophy and Theological Research, I'm sorry, Philosophical and Theological Research, and has written a number of published works uh, in the International Journal of Philosophy and Religion, Philosophia Christi, um, as well as a number of books. And Dr. Arbor specializes in uh, a number of different metaphysical areas, but one of which that we'll be talking about today is open theism, divine knowledge, and so uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Arbor here. Ben, how you doing? Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm doing well. Mike, good to see you. Um, Tyler, good to see you as well. I'm really honored to be here. I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing here on the podcast, and uh, it's really special to be invited on. So thanks for having me. Well, it's, it's awesome to have you, uh, Ben. It's good to see you, and I uh, really look forward to whenever we get to hang out in the real life. But uh, yeah, to, to go ahead and, and start this off, uh, want it here want it, you here to discuss open theism so very briefly what is open theism or maybe open theisms or something uh, yeah. what, 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 what is this view that seems so controversial at least in some evangelical circles well um, I think it's important that you've identified that maybe there's not just open theism but open theisms because uh, there's a lot of different versions of this but there are some commonalities and from my research I've been able to try to figure versions of open theism, uh, all of them basically think that God doesn't know the future. And there may be different reasons for why these different versions uh, or proponents of those versions don't think God knows the future. Um, but all of them seem to have that in common. They also, that is open theisms, all seem to have in common the idea that God is in time um, and that God learns things as they come into being. So, um, Open theists believe that the future is underdetermined. So there's, there's no fixed reality about the way that the world is going to be. Uh, maybe that's because we have free will and we would exercise our free will to bring about this or that. Or um, some open theists believe that ontological randomness is just built into the way that the world is. So as things come into being and move from being contingent to being actual, um, God is learning that. So he's, he's in time and as the future becomes reality and uh, God figures stuff out, he's learning just like we learn. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of different uh, versions as to why somebody might believe those things. But again, open theism is the idea that God does not know the future, that God is in time and that he learns as uh, certain things become true. Just before we go there, I, I think it might be good to identify that um, some of the versions of open theism that are out there are primarily motivated by theological concerns. Um, and that would be kind of the biblical texts and uh, Gregory Boyd, maybe. Bible. Uh, so Greg Boyd, I think that's um, from both sides here in the sense that he yeah. does, he has a theologically mo uh, motivated version of open theism, but also some philosophically motivated. As opposed to like the theological open theist that I would have in mind um, would be Clark Pinnock, um, John Sanders, um, Richard Rice, some of those thinkers more so than philosophically motivated open theists who would include people like Richard Swinburne, Peter Van Inwagen, William Hasker, um, Alan Arbor. Uh, no, 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 not me. Um, but um, I guess one way to situate this, I, I'll give you two arguments for open theism. Um, I think that the standard one is to see that the dilemma of freedom and foreknowledge is a really serious problem. Um, how can God know the future? If, if everything that God knows, if he infallibly knows it so that he can't be wrong, if God knows that I'm going to drink orange juice with my breakfast tomorrow, um, then if I have free will tomorrow morning, if I decide not to drink orange juice, do I have the ability to bring it about that God was wrong? Well, that doesn't seem right. Um, but it sure seems like I have free will. So one way to solve this dilemma, well, actually, excuse me, this doesn't solve the dilemma. It's a capitulation to the dilemma to say that there really is a dilemma between freedom and foreknowledge. And I don't want to give up free will. So I just give up the idea that God knows the future. Um, there are, are 
plenty of open theists who have reasoned in that way. Um, and just to briefly mention the tradition here, uh, historically, Christians who have worried about that dilemma have either tried to solve the dilemma or when they have capitulated, they've capitulated against free will, not against divine foreknowledge. So it's relatively recent, just in the last 30 or 40 years, that um, in the minds of, of some people, it has become acceptable to jettison uh, divine foreknowledge or modify our understanding of divine foreknowledge in this way. So anyway, there's one way to arrive at open theism is just by reasoning through the dilemma of freedom and foreknowledge. Now, there's another way to arrive at open theism that hinges on um, some issues that are a little bit technical in the metaphysics of time. If you're someone like me who thinks that truth is a property that supervenes upon being, um, and you're someone not like me who thinks that the future is not ontologically real, maybe you're a presentist, maybe you are a growing block theorist, then you could say that because the future is not ontologically real, there's nothing there in terms of being for truth to supervene upon. So we get into this category of propositions called propositions concerning future contingents, and those things are underdetermined, and because they're underdetermined, there is no truth value. So take the proposition, Ben will drink orange juice tomorrow with his breakfast. Uh, some people who are indeterminist and think that maybe I have free will with respect to whether or not to drink the orange juice and hold to these views about time where the future is not real, they would just say that the proposition, Ben will drink the orange juice tomorrow, um, they're either going to say that that proposition has no truth value at all, or they're going to say it's false. It's false that Ben will drink the orange juice. Um, and there's different ways of cashing out how they would arrive at it being false. One is to say, well, truth supervenes upon being, um, and there is no, there's nothing that is there, so there's nothing for it to be true. Uh, they might also say that the word will in the proposition, Ben will drink the orange juice, has a determinate force to it. And if it's determined, well, then it's not a free event anymore. Um, and if it is a free event, then it's false to say that Ben will, because that is to say that Ben will freely yet determinately drink the orange juice, and that doesn't make any sense. So there's lots of different ways why they would say that that's false. So um, with respect to the future, God, God doesn't know the future because there is no future there to know. Um, if you develop your metaphysics of time that way, there are some versions of open theism that I understand how people could arrive at those versions if they believe that God was in time. Um, I don't share that view. I think God is timeless. Um, so I understand how people can arrive at that version of open theism or that family of open theisms, which I call open future open theisms. And there's, you know, two or three different versions of, of that view. Um, that view has been defended uh, by Patrick Todd, who has a, a new book coming out with uh, Oxford University Press defending that view. Um, Alan Rhoda defends that view. Greg Boyd defends that view. Dale Tuggy defends a different version of uh, open future open theism. But that would contrast with a different version of open theism that I call limited foreknowledge open theism. And that's the view that's defended by William Hasker, Richard Swinburne, and Peter Van Inwagen. These thinkers think that there are truths about the future. There, there are truths that exist about the future and God does not know them. Um, and there's different ways of articulating how it is that God doesn't know them. Um, most of, at least all three of those thinkers think that it's impossible for God to know those things. Uh, other people like uh, Dallas Willard, um, also Clark Pinnock, they believe that God made a decision to choose not to know those things in order to give us free will. And if God had chosen to know those things, then we wouldn't have been able to have free will. Sometimes that's called uh, a divine nescience view. And um, so anyway, there's just a little bit about some different versions, but just just to put a bow on that, two arguments as to how people get to open right, theism. Right. One is um, by reasoning through the dilemma of freedom and foreknowledge. 
-hmm. And then the other one is to motivate a case for open theism by way of a particular take on the metaphysics of time and right. the nature of truth itself. Yeah. Uh, real quick, before I get to my last question, pitch it off to Mike, call, maybe consider this like a half question or something. Um, what do you think about the approach? I'm a classical theist, you're a classical theist. Uh, we both affirm strong views of simplicity, I, I believe. Uh, you know, what, what, do you t what do you take to about the approach, you know, the sort of response to divine foreknowledge, human freedom dilemma where uh, we understand, you know, God is knowledge, right? It's not like God possesses um, uh, this property or God possesses knowledge in the way that you and I do, right? Um, mm -hmm. We talk about uh, God has God has knowledge in a different way <laughs> that you and I that you and I have knowledge, and so perhaps the constraints or the sort of necessary entailments that follow when a, say a, an infallible creature or a creature who has infallible knowledge right might, might might come about right some of those consequences might come about don't necessarily apply or uh, follow from. Um, uh, God having infallible foreknowledge because what it means for God to have knowledge or uh, foreknowledge uh, is, is different. And because there's this gap between our understanding of, um, of knowledge or foreknowledge and, and God's, we can't say what necessarily follows. We have to sort of be open uh, uh, to that. So I don't know. I wanted to see. So it, it sort of endorses a Mysterian view. And so yeah, I kind of. Your there's, thoughts on that. there's some mysterianism there and there's there's also um some parallels to some issues in skeptical theism that i think are here um the version of skeptical theism that i would endorse is just very modest and and all it it stems from epistemic humility just hey i don't know we and i don't think we know we are finite creatures um as much as we've studied and as much as in the history of humanity we've studied, we're still making tremendous advancements all the time. Um, and, and even just different responses to the dilemma of freedom and foreknowledge, it wasn't but just several hundred years ago that Molina developed what we call Molinism today, which I'm, I'm not a Molinist, but I recognize that it's still possible that there may be these puzzles that novel attempted solutions could still be developed. Um, as a result of that, when we take all of that and start thinking about God, um, I, I take transcendence very seriously in the sense that I think God is not like us. Um, I think his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Um, and I don't know how much we can or cannot know about God, uh, about divine knowledge. Um, I think we can know something, but I'm not sure that we can know everything. And I'm I am certain that we cannot know everything exhaustively. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's some Mysterianism there. Uh, the doctrine of analogy, I think, is definitely going to come into play, that the way that we would speak about divine knowledge, I'm not sure that we should speak about that the same way that we would speak about our knowledge. Um, especially, I, I'm, I'm somebody who is attracted to virtue epistemology, and I think that the way that we go about typically arriving at knowledge is by instancing particular intellectual virtues. Um, I, I don't think that God learns in the same way that we do. So how God comes into knowledge or even, even the question of what is divine knowledge. I mean, when we take knowledge to be something like justified true belief plus whatever it takes to overcome Gettier objections or warranted true belief or something like that, um, I'm not sure that God has beliefs um, right. and uh, or maybe God just has one big belief or what, it, what does it mean for God to have a belief? Um, I, I definitely don't think God requires any kind of warrant or justification um, for turning a belief into knowledge. So the nature of divine knowledge itself is something that I think has not been, we haven't paid adequate attention to that. So divine epistemology versus human epistemology. Um, and I, I remember having a conversation with James Sennett um, and Sandra Visser about this very subject several, several years ago at a conference in um, Kentucky. And uh, 
James was asking me, yeah, but, but how can God know the future? How is it possible? And he was asking me about the mechanics of how I responded to the dilemma of freedom and foreknowledge. And I just told him like, look, I'm not sure what divine knowledge is. Exactly. And, and if I can't tell you what divine knowledge is, I don't have any reason to think that I have the ability to tell you how God comes to have it. Um, now, maybe that's a cop out. And I, I definitely don't think that we should punt to mystery early. Uh, a lot of times I think that's laziness. I do think that there's room for us to do a lot of deep philosophical It, it, it seems reflection. like it, it, it predicts it though, right? The doctrine of simplicity. So where knowledge just is, is omnipotence, is omnipotence just is, is omnibenevolence, which is just his existence, which is just existence itself. So it's, sure. I mean, it, it's, it's like, what, what do you expect on this hypothesis of, of classical theism? Uh, so it, it doesn't seem kind of like ad hoc, uh, an ad hoc punt or anything like that. It seems something yeah, that's kind of well suited for the hypothesis, something you'd expect. Um, yeah, so I, I've got a, a different thing I'm working on right now that uh, I think there, that some levels of Mysterianism um, might be insurmountable, uh, right. especially given the philosophical methods that, that we use. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm a classical theist, but I'm a classical theist of the Anselmian variety more so than a, a Thomistic variety. But I think that the doctrine of analogy is important. So yes, I want to practice my maximal greatness, perfect being theology, but I recognize that anything that we say about divine power or divine knowledge is, is going to be analogical because of divine transcendence, because of a, a strong distinction between the creator and the creation. All right. Very good. Uh, well, last question for me, and then I'll pass it off to Mike. Um, what, what, what's your main motivation, or what, what's the best argument you think against open theism oh against open theism against uh, the, the best argument against open theism um well i would say it really depends on which version of open theism we're talking about um the limited foreknowledge versions of open theism i don't think uh adequately describe the cognitive perfections that we would expect of a metaphysically perfect being uh, to say that god does not know some things that are true would mean that God is ignorant of some things. Matter of fact, um, Richard Swinburne has, has said that, and I'll quote him, um, God's ignorance is vast. That's, um, that's a direct quote from Swinburne. So uh, that doesn't strike me as religiously adequate for the kinds of Anselmian articulations of a metaphysically perfect being. Now, there would be plenty of people who disagree, and we could talk about how my intuitions are going to differ from theirs on various points. Um, but I, I think that there are actually other arguments in the neighborhood of limited foreknowledge, open theism that you could make to, to show that that view is going to be problematic. Um, some of them are probably, at least in my own work, going to revolve around certain understandings of the doctrine of creation and the shifting of um, a, a possible world being brought into being and becoming actual. Um, so the, the metaphysics of creation in this way, you, you, there's a, a time um, prior to creation because God is in time eternally or everlastingly on this view. Um, there's a time where God surveys the entire realm of possibilia, but there's, there's no actuality. Um, and then God at some point chooses to actualize a possible world and make it a real world. Uh, and upon doing so, there's this new category of truths that didn't antecedently exist. Um, truths about the actual future that God doesn't know. Um, and depending on how you catch this out, it gets really technical. Um, there's a movement down from God knowing 100% of all truths to God knowing less than 100% of all truths. It, it's technical. And my friend Elijah Hess has... Um, has been a good sparring partner on this issue because he would say no that on the limited foreknowledge view that's always been the case but but there's a category change that i think is taking place with respect to actuality um so anyway for lots of reasons i don't think that those versions are going to work but the open future open theisms those are a little more technical um i think that like one one argument against those versions of uh, open theism is going to revolve around 
um, arguments for the timelessness of God. Because if God's timeless, then none of this stuff matters at all. So if you can develop a positive case for classical theism, or even if you don't want the whole First way, maybe the whole gamut of classical theism, um, maybe you don't like simplicity and you don't like impassibility, but, but you do like timelessness. If you can prove timelessness, then you've disproven open future, open theism. But I actually think there are non-theological uh, ways of, of trying to do that. Um, I don't think that open future, open theists have developed uh, an adequate semantics of the metaphysics of modality. Uh, what we saw in the 20th century with the work of um, people like Quine and Plantinga and others was the, the whole discourse around possible worlds. Well, a possible world is, includes a complete and total world history. Um, it, there's a, a giant state of affairs, as uh, David Armstrong would describe possible worlds, that, that obtains at each possible world. Well, for open future open theists, like, we don't live in a possible world. We're, we're still becoming. So the world that we're in now is a different world than the one that we're in now is a different world than the one that we're in now and on and on and on. So it, it's really tricky to know um, how, how to talk about modality. It's also really tricky on open future open theism to explain exactly what it is that God doesn't know, right? Because if I'm an open future open theist, and I say to you, Tyler, you're a class with you. So let me, let me just put on my open theism hat for a second. Um, and I say, it's open theism great again. <laughs> um, I would, I would say to you, you think God knows what will happen in the future, but I don't think God knows what will happen in the future. I think you're perfectly well within your rights to say, well, excuse me, Ben. I mean, if you're an open theist, how can you say that you don't think God knows what will happen in the future? Because if it will happen in the future, then it's determinate. And God can know the determinants. He just can't know the indeterminates. He can't know the future contingents. And then I say, well, then God doesn't know what will contingently happen in the future. And you're like, well, I don't know what it means for something to will contingently happen in the future. Because will is taken um, by those who adopt what's called the Piercean semantic, as opposed to the Occamist semantic. Uh, will is taken to have a, a certain force. It's, a, it's an operator that works to convey determinacy. Um, and so how to describe what God does or doesn't know with respect to the future is, is a linguistic problem. Yeah, I've always, I've always struggled with, with that, wondering what an open theist would say about like, I can know something about the future, but God, God can't. And so that, that's always kind of bugged me. So I, I do yeah. think there, there's something. So fishy. there's a... Um, a collection of essays that I edited on open theism and Robert Stewart, who teaches at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, has a, a paper arguing something similar that it, it's very strange that we have the ability to know things that God does not know. Um, right. one, one quick thing just relating this to Christian theism in particular and not just a, a generic monotheism. I do think that there's a theological argument um, against open future open theism. Uh, that, that hinges on this whole idea of indeterminacy, free will, and things like that. Now, there's several premises that people could say, well, you're, you're baking a lot of this into this, but um, I am persuaded that there is a specific day and hour when Christ will return. Um, I'm persuaded of that because Jesus specifically says that the Father knows the day and the hour of the return. Now, if it is true that there is a day and an hour that is fixed when Christ is going to return, we run into a problem about freedom because I believe that we have free will with respect to whether or not to evangelize, whether or not we will preach the gospel, whether or not we will obey and fulfill the Great Commission. But if we have free will with respect to that, then when the nations are reached with the good news of Jesus is in some sense up to us, right? It's up to us to exercise our free will rightly. But we also know that the end cannot happen until the nations are reached with the good news of Jesus because Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed as a testimony unto all the nations 
and then the end will come. So there is a sort of guarantee that the Great Commission will be fulfilled prior to Christ returning. Uh, moreover, the Apostle Peter in one of his epistles tells us that we are to live in such a way that hastens the day of the coming of the Lord. Now, I don't know how that's possible if there's a fixed time, but in some sense, uh, Christ will not return until the Great Commission has been fulfilled. And the fulfillment of the Great Commission is counterfactually dependent upon us using our free will to bring it about that the nations hear the good news of Jesus. And yet, the Father knows the day and the hour of the return of the Son. So there's this future event that God knows, and yet that future event is counterfactually dependent on free will choices of, of us mere humans. So it, it doesn't really seem to me that the case that the open future open theists make fits with uh, an informed view of at least some of the events surrounding the parousia of Christ as uh, revealed in the scriptures. So that's a yeah. theological argument against this philosophical view. All right, uh, Mike, you're, you're yeah. up. Ben, well, I appreciate your time, brother. Thank you so much. Before we let you go, can you maybe fill us in on some projects you're working on now, new stuff that's coming out? Um, I know you hinted on some new stuff that you're, you're working on. So just uh, what can we look for from Ben Arbor in the future, if there is um, such a thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, if there is such a thing. Uh, I hope there is. God be kind to me, please. Um, so I have a chapter coming out in a forthcoming volume called the TNT Clark Companion to Analytic Theology. Uh, my chapter is on divine omniscience there. Um, kind of excited about that piece. It was a development of one of the chapters of my uh, doctoral dissertation that I had an opportunity to go back and relook at and make some modifications to. Um, uh, I'm also working with Greg Ganzel to finish up a, a long time project that's called Christian Theology and the Modern Philosophers. That's something, a history of philosophy of religion and a history of how theistic concerns have shaped the philosophical projects of thinkers from Rene Descartes up to the present day. Um, we're hoping to get that manuscript delivered to the press soon. Uh, so there's a chance that we would see that in 2021 or for sure by 2022. Um, that's been a, a very long project. Um, and then I've, I've got a paper that I continue to work on um, related to classical theism uh, as opposed to openness conceptions of God and ways of um, maybe trying to test for that. Um, and I, I presented a version of that paper last year. I continue to work on it um, about a, a kind of methodological naturalism that seems to be practiced when people are doing uh, metaphysics. And I, I'm not sure that that's a really good way to go about doing things. It seems like if you're someone like me and you think God is a necessary being and even a logically necessary being, then trying to think about anything without thinking about the way that God fits into that state of affairs uh, seems like a fool's errand. So it would be tricky to develop a, some kind of metaphysical test for whether or not God is a classical being or, or that God is the kind of being that he's thought to be by classical theists or that God is uh, the kind of being he's thought to be by open theists. Um, so that, that's something that I'm continuing to work on and hopefully I'll, I'll submit that for review. Um, early in 2021 and so yeah i i hear that uh, that uh companion book has a really good chapter in religious epistemology from from what i hear. oh really <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I, I will say that in that chapter i i was interested in a really diverse set of ideas so um although i i do um cite texts uh from the new testament to make it uh, an especially Christian piece, and what I have to say, I think, accords with a Christian view of divine omniscience. Uh, I make sure to cite from the Hebrew Bible as well, uh, and even from the Quran. I, I think that the ideas that I'm trying to develop there would be consistent with uh, all three of the great Abrahamic faiths uh, about the, the nature of divine knowledge. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Dr. Arbor, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, great to visit with you guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, wish you guys the best in, in your future endeavors. Thank you, brother. Thank you.